Thank you to everyone who helped to write the sermon tonight. You all have done a great job of turning in questions relative to Noah and the flood. Uh, you weren't trying to make this a short sermon. I tried to help you out and decided that we'll address three categories of questions tonight and save three more for next week. I want you to do as Luke prayed that we ought to, to listen tonight and compare whatever you hear to what you know the Bible says. We remember in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that God's judgment of a people in Berea was that they were more noble than those who Paul had just seen in Thessalonica and interacted with. Why? Because they searched the Scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul was saying were so. The Bible's the standard. Whatever it says... Well, that's what goes. That's the way things are. That's the truth. But sometimes we wonder about things that the Bible does not address specifically, and it seems that that's where most of our questions come in. The Bible's where we go for our answers to things. Whenever you're not finding an answer in the Bible, where do you go? I want to, as always, whenever we... Uh, go about something like this to recommend a few resources to you. And I meant to list them up here on the screen. But often you'll find a question that you're wondering about answered on the Christian Courier website. ChristianCourier.com ought to be a site that you visit whenever you have questions that are spiritual and biblical in nature. Especially when it comes to things like this that have to do with apologetics in the Bible apologeticspress.org has a lot of good uh, resources there. There's a book that's now past 50 years old, but that really created the interest in what's now called creation science. It's titled The Genesis Flood by Drs. John C. Whitcomb and Henry M. Morris. It's continued to be reprinted and reprinted, and more than 300,000 copies have been sold, I believe. Now, again, you read that book, and you look at those websites, and you measure them against the Bible. Whitcomb and Morris have a, a lot of uh, good information and challenging things from both a biblical and a scientific perspective. Now, you're going to find some Calvinism as you come across some explanations of certain things there. But if you're a mature Bible student, you know what to do with that. One more resource that I've I've not seen. I just recently became aware of it, and maybe we'd all like to take a look at it. But World Video Bible School, some of our brethren in Texas, have produced a DVD titled The Reality of Noah's Ark. And that features Dr. Branyon May. And he's done some writing for Apologetics Press, so maybe that's something that we would like to get our hands on. Okay, I'm not going to repeat every question that was put in the box out there, but I've put them into categories, I said. And first, we had some questions about food. In particular, uh, all the questions uh, that we're going to address tonight have to do with things that preceded the flood, things we read a little bit about coming up to the flood, maybe just a little bit after, but... Someone asked, were people all vegetarians before the flood? Were people vegetarians or were they omnivores like most of us are today? That means we'll eat vegetables and we'll eat meat too. Where would you begin to answer that question? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 and think about what God said to the first people that he created, just not long after he had created them. Genesis chapter 1, and verses 26 and 27, we find that God created man, male and female, in his own image, different and superior to everything he had created. And then in verse 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. First mention of food in the Bible and what's specifically mentioned are fruits. What comes from plants. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, after God had 
put Adam in the Garden of Eden to look after it and take care of it. Verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So here's one tree from which they're not supposed to eat. We know how things went there. But he says, Of every other tree in the garden, well, you may surely eat of it. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, after Adam and Eve have already eaten from that one tree that was forbidden, and they're finding out how in in so many ways the curse of sin is going to affect them, verses 18 and 19, God says, "...thorns and thistles the ground shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread." Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for your dust, and to dust you shall return. Once again, we see food specifically mentioned, and it's, it's plant food. And you can eat bread. Well, we know that comes from grain. So that's, a, that's about it, that you have specifically about food before the flood. Have you heard anything about meat yet? Well, I haven't specifically. Well, then you turn to Genesis chapter 9. Verses 1 through 3, after Noah and his family have disembarked, the Bible says, Genesis 9, 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Do your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Now, there's a little bit of limitation that comes after that. Genesis 9, 1 through 3 sounds in many ways like what we could have read in Genesis chapter 1 if we'd read a little bit more after God created the earth. He got everything started, and he reminds the people then to be fruitful and multiply the earth. Well, he said that back in Genesis chapter 1 to Adam and Eve. He uh, told them in Genesis chapter 1, you're going to have dominion over it all. We see that again here. We read again about uh, people being made in God's image, but he talks about food again. And this time, we find not only plants, but he says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And then, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Now, in our minds, we're just about inserting a word there when we read that. As I gave you green plants, now I give you everything. And maybe that's the meaning here. The word is not there, but all the evidence we have up to that point specifically about food is that people were only eating a vegetarian diet, and now they can have meat. Now, some people will go back and think about, well, Adam and Eve's son. One was a keeper of the land. One was a keeper of animals. Abel, he kept sheep. Well, would that necessarily imply that Abel was eating lamb? There are lots of good uses for a sheep, right, as far as the wool, making clothing and and all of that. So that doesn't necessarily imply that he was eating meat at that time. It would appear that sacrifices had been being made since the beginning of time. We infer perhaps that whenever God clothed Adam and Eve in animal skins, that sacrifices were made of those animals, but was anybody eating the meat of those animals? The Bible doesn't tell us that. Now, but Noah was told to take animals upon the ark, wasn't he? How many? How many of each kind of animal? Now, to some people, that's a trick question. He was supposed to take pairs of animals, right? But even more than that, of some animals, look at Genesis chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Genesis 7, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you're righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs, or maybe your King James Version says sevens, of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and sevens seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. Yes, some animals, 
there were only two of on the ark. Other animals, there were seven or seven pairs of on the ark. And they're differentiated as clean and unclean. Later in the Bible, whenever uh, the Israelites are organized as a nation, in Leviticus chapter 11, God lays down laws through Moses about what you eat and what you don't eat. You eat the clean animals, you do not eat the meat of the unclean animals. But is that what that meant back here in Genesis chapter 7? Probably this has to do with which animals you sacrifice or which you don't. Because again, as Noah gets off the ark, he's making a sacrifice. So it doesn't look like, like they were eating meat yet to me. You keep studying your Bible and see what you think. Here's something our friend Eric Lyons wrote. He said, however, just because God apparently did not authorize man to eat animal flesh before the flood does not mean that mankind abided by this regulation. It seems likely that there were some people who went beyond what God allowed and ate various kinds of animals anyway. It's not difficult to imagine those living just prior to the flood whose every thought was evil continually, leaning over a sacrificial sheep, smelling the sweet aroma, and taking a bite out of a lamb's leg. We know people. um, We know the smell of good meat. Roasting and barbecuing, right, Josh? Smoking. We know it. So, was everybody a vegetarian back then? I don't know. Were they supposed to be? Perhaps so. Maybe you can read a little bit in the Bible and and find out more. So, uh, that covered several questions that were asked about food. And what about another category? Several questions were asked about the 120 years that we read about in Genesis chapter 6. I want to go ahead and read verses 1 through 8 to help us get ready for a few more uh, questions that come in these last two categories. Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. When men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them... The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So there's the context. But back up there in verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man, or my spirit shall not contend with man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. What was God talking about when he said his days shall be 120 years? Well, two answers primarily have been given to that. On the one hand, was God saying 120 years until the flood? Or was he saying, on the other hand, human lifespan, and this is just kind of, kind of hard to fathom for us, but human lifespan will be reduced to about 120 years. Those usually are the two answers that are given to a question about this passage. What do you think? You've heard a little bit what I think in this series so far. Flowing out of uh, genealogical records in chapter 5, a life expectancy that was severely reduced to 120 would really make quite a statement. Noah is the last person who's mentioned in Scripture to live most of a millennium. Scan back with me over chapter 5. We read about Noah and him fathering children. Chapter 5, verse 5 says, Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Verse 8, Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And in verse 11, Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Kenan, verse 14, 910 years. 
Mahalalel, verse 17, 895 years. Jared, in verse 20, 962 years. Enoch's different in verses 23 and 24. That's all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Verse 27, thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. In verse 31, Lamech, 777 years. And, and then we join Noah in his 500th year of life. So you read through a chapter like that, and then you come to what we find in Genesis chapter 6. And it could well be that God is still talking about lifespans here whenever he says 120 years. Turn over to Genesis chapter 9, the last two verses, 28 and 29. It says, After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Lifespans were different before the flood. Things were different before the flood. Now, some people would say, see, that's why the earth was an endless salad bar at that time. Let's get back to that kind of diet and things will be better for us here. Well, the Bible doesn't necessarily join those two items together. But Noah's the last one you read about living to an age like 950 years when you go on down to reading about Shem's descendants in chapter 11, you read in verses 10 and 11 that Shem was 100 years old when he fathered our Paxad two years after the flood, and Shem lived after he fathered our Paxad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. So Shem, well, he only lived to 600 years old. Poor fellow, you'd say, right? Only 600 years, and then... Verses 12 and 13 are packed sad. You have 35 plus 43. And then verse 14, Sheila, 30 years plus 403. And, and that's kind of the norm down through here until you get into the, the 200s. And then you look down at verse 24, when Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. So you're getting down here in the end of this chapter, close to that neighborhood of 120 years. But it was really still a long time before 120 was the norm in a human lifespan. You remember what Genesis chapter 90 verse 10 says? Now, I'm sorry, there is no, if you remember what Genesis chapter 90 verse 10 says, I've got a Never mind. Psalm 90, verse 10. Psalm 90, verse 10. People who have memorized that mostly have memorized it from an old version, like the King James. But this psalm is unique out of all of them in that the old inscription at the top of it says, not that it was written by David or Solomon or someone like that, but that it was written by Moses. That's an old, old inscription there. Genesis 90, verse 10 says, The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Now, if Moses is the one that, that wrote that, he can write it and say, hey, Amen, we lived to 70 or 80 years old, and it gets away fast. What a far cry from living into the 900s. But Moses lived a long, long, long time after the flood before God gave him words to say, this is about what you get in human life now. So if God is saying there in Genesis chapter 6 that man's lifespan is going to be shortened to about 120, it took God a long time to, to make things that way. Now, the view that you've heard me... Uh, mention a few times during this series is that what we read about when we're reading about 120 years in Genesis chapter 6 is that that's a, how long it was until D-Day, until God sent that first drop of rain that made the flood. To me, that makes sense with something that we saw in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20 this morning, that Christ was 
preaching in his spirit through Noah to those spirits who are now in prison while God's patience was waiting in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. It seems to me that that 120 years is, is something of a countdown to what we see happening as the flood comes about. Now, that's the other side of that. It, it makes for a challenging thought, but if that is the case, if, if what I believe is right, that God's saying 120 years is all I've got left with this bunch of wicked people, except for Noah and his family, that does not lead us inevitably to the conclusion then that it took Noah that long to build the ark, nor that Noah was actively preaching all of that time. Now, that makes for good lessons. That makes for good thought that, man, that guy was persistent in his faith to keep working on that ark that long. It had to take a long time to build the ark. I don't know if it had to take that long. It would have taken me that long for sure. And that's the illustration that's been used about a, being persistent with someone and, and with people and in your evangelism. Noah preached 120 years and only saved eight souls. We've heard and we've said before. Well, that conclusion is not there inevitably. But Noah was no less a man of faith and and obedience in God. But those, are, those are the two options that, that present themselves to us when it comes to 120 years. And then the third category of questions that we'll talk about tonight and then stop for now has to do with those uh, Nephilim that we read about in verse 4 of chapter 6. I'll read the first four verses again. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Who are those people, the Nephilim? Now, there are two things that are not explicit here. And some people are very, very sure that they have identified some people here in certain ways. I don't see how they can. The first is the identity of the people who are called the sons of God in verse 4. And then second, it's not absolutely explicit here that the Nephilim were the offspring of the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. That might be suggested here, but it's not, not necessarily the conclusion. But people have taken off from here with some very, very fanciful theories. Now, Genesis chapters 4 and 5 make me think that the sons of God in this verse are the people who were descended from Seth, who are in that line that we were reading about when we were looking at their ages in Genesis chapter 5. Here's a heritage of people that included men like Enoch. And as we saw in that list of men in successive generations, he stood out. He was different. He didn't live on earth 900-something years. Because he had an accident, because somebody murdered him, because something bad about him? No. The Bible says he was no more. God took him at 365 years. Well, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that's because God was pleased with him. He walked with God, the Bible says here. And God translated him without his ever seeing death. There were men like that in that line of people from Seth. Uh, down to Noah. And it seems to me that flowing out of that chapter, that'd be the best explanation for who the sons of God are. But there's another, more popularly proposed theory about who these men are, and that is that they were angels or fallen angels. 
And the vast majority of commentaries you would pick up on Genesis chapter 6, or if you went online searching for answers to questions you have about these first few verses, they're going to tell you that's who they were. It is true that several times in the Old Testament that sons of God refers to angels. But it seems to me like Jesus lowers the boom on on the interpretation that that's who they are here when he says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, that in the resurrection, there's no marrying or being given in marriage. There's no marriage. Rather, people are like the angels in heaven. I have a hard time getting around that verse when I'm trying to figure out what Genesis chapter 6 is saying about the sons of God. Um, Angels are a higher order of created beings than humans, according to Hebrews chapter 1. Just like humans are a higher order of created beings than all the animals in Genesis chapter 1. Humans, I don't don't even want to talk about this very long, but humans cannot reproduce with animals. Now, why would we think any differently about angels in fallen form or, or demons being able to reproduce with humans. Now, some of these guys, and some that I've mentioned in a favorable light before, like uh, Morris, come up with this hybrid theory. Well, these demons got into these men, and, and they're as bad of people as you ever saw on the earth. And then... They had relations with women, the daughters of men mentioned here, and the offspring were the Nephilim. Well, when I think about that, I think too about Jesus' time. Now, in the time of Noah, the whole world's population was destroyed because of the pervasive influence of these beings. Whenever I see Jesus encountering a person who's demon-possessed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I see Jesus acting with compassion. Because there were people who were doing things physically and perhaps otherwise that were beyond their control. Is God punishing people in Genesis chapter 6 for things beyond their control? Well, no, he's not. But you have to think about the sons of God before you think of the Nephilim there because of their connection here. But some people's theory makes Nephilim uh, half-demon, half-human monsters then who were roaming the earth at the time. Now, I've, got, I've chosen to make this the picture on the slide here when we're talking about Nephilim. If you... Uh, Say you Googled that word looking for a picture to put on your PowerPoint slide. That word has been borrowed for some really scary-looking individuals in all kinds of games these days. But I put this word up here instead, this Hebrew word. Most of our more recent translations are just showing us The Hebrew word, whenever we come to this verse in the Bible, is Nephilim. And they're admitting, those translators, we don't know what to do with this word for sure. Now, if I had read the King James Version to you, I would have read that there were giants in the land, right? Uh, Harris, Archer, and Walkie are the editors of the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. And I took a picture of this word from that book. And, and they say that there's really no evidence that anybody thought about the Nephilim as giants before the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible. Many of you know what that is, but 200, 250 years before the time of Christ, many, many Jews had begun to speak more Greek than they did their old Hebrew. And so the Bible was translated into Greek. And when it was, those translators translated this word, Nephilim, gigantes, where we get our word gigantic. And so from that time on, uh, many people have thought 
of the Bible here is talking about giants. Now, the thing about it with the Old Testament and its Hebrew origin, we don't have so many uh, common pieces of writing in that language from ancient times to compare and find out, well, how were they using a word like that back in that time? When it comes to the New Testament, besides all those almost 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament that are in Greek, you have all kinds of letters that other people wrote or, or bills of sale or other pieces of literature. And so you compare and you see, well, how were they using that word in that time? Well, that's not so easy to do with the Hebrew. And so this word's going to stay veiled in in some measure of obscurity. And those editors of that theological word book of the Old Testament say you you really can't nail it down to, to something that comes from some other word, as some people have tried to do. When you look at these... Uh, beings in verse 4, they could have been big. Uh, they could have been mighty. They could have been fierce war warriors. They might have been really mean. One of the questions that was uh, put into the box asked about, well, why do you see them on both sides in time of the flood? Because you do. Turn to one last scripture with me this morning. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. The end of this chapter, the last thing we hear from those faithless spies who went to scout out the promised land on behalf of the rest of the Israelites. After they had been there, they decided they didn't want to go back. We can't go back. We remember how Joshua and Caleb stood out as the only people with faith in God to go and do what God said they could do. But they said this in Numbers 13, verses 32 and 33. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim. We seemed ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. It's the only other use of that word in the Bible or really anywhere else in ancient writing. Well, we get the idea from these faithless spies, but again, we're listening to faithless spies to get our information that these are big guys. That they might be what we would think of as giants. Well, whatever the case, they're found either side of the flood. If they were a race, they should have been eradicated by that big deluge. But maybe it was physical characteristics. And if it was, then those characteristics were still in the, in the gene pool of humans. After the flood, if it was personality traits, then those propensities could still pop up after the flood. In the end, I'm not someone who feels like I can tell you definitely about who these people were. I just feel pretty sure about telling you about what they were not because of what the Bible tells us. But it's an interesting detail there. Again, you give me your good answers out in the foyer after we're done all these good questions that you have answered. Let's leave it there for tonight, and then we'll look at a few more questions next Sunday night, again in three categories. Next week, we'll look at questions about water. Where did all that water come from, and where did all that water go? Those were a couple of the questions that were submitted. We uh, received several questions about life inside the ark. How was that handled? And then some good questions about fossils, which we've talked a little bit about in this series, but one in particular, like, where are all the human fossils? Real good question. Well, I'm glad that the Bible answers all of the most important questions. It doesn't necessarily answer everything that we wonder about definitively, but it answers all of life's most important questions. Who am I? Whence did I come? Where am I going? The Bible answers those questions. The Bible Bible poses questions to us that we ought to ask as well. Such as that very, very, very important question, what must I do to be saved? A 
fellow who really had no idea how to answer that question for himself asked it of Paul and Silas. As recorded in Acts chapter 16, he was the jailer who was holding them overnight in a place that they did not deserve to be, but a place where they were still praising God at midnight, in pain, shackled, That jailer asked those men from God, What must I do to be saved? They told him, Believe on the Lord Jesus, you and all your house, and you will be saved. So they told him that night, and told his family that night about Jesus, who he is, and what he did, and where he is now, and what he wanted to do for the jailer and for everyone. And the jailer took them that hour of the night, and he washed their stripes. It appears he was so sorry for what had happened to Paul and Silas so unjustly. He's penitent for the part he's playing in all of this. And the Bible says they were baptized that night. And that would be because Paul told that man the same thing that Ananias had told him years before. Once he had heard about Jesus and his need, he said, What are you waiting for? Acts 22, verse 16. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. What must I do to be saved? The Bible doesn't leave us with any doubt about that. God doesn't want to leave us with any doubt about where we came from, about what our purpose in life is, about where we are going. If you want those questions answered the right way and and know that, that you have God answers for your life. And, well, that's what we want for you too, and that's what God wants for you. If we can help you spiritually tonight, we're inviting you to come up here while we stand and sing this song.